Hello, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to this, the annual meeting of the UK Metric Association. A special word of welcome to those of our guests who haven't yet joined the association. If you feel you'd like to, please do feel free and you'll find us on ukma.org.uk. Before we start, I want to say a few words about uh, today's programme. We're very pleased to be able to welcome our keynote speaker, James Vincent, who has just published his book, Beyond Measure, about the history of units of measurement. And he's going to talk a bit about uh, that and give you a taste of it. And hopefully you will feel tempted to buy the book and read it. After that, uh, I'll be saying a few words about government proposals to change the um, rules about weights and measures. And then we're going to have a couple of words about imperial residuals from Ronnie Cohen, and this has to do with units which are still in use around the world, despite the move to metric. Um, Raphael Sofa will be talking first of all about ways of achieving change and motivating people, and then he'll be talking about the other nations of the UK, the devolved nations. And Martin Ward will be giving us a talk called Time Moves On. At the end, there'll be an opportunity for members to say a few words about um, how they feel about the whole thing, and then we'll finish. So that's the plan for today. And without further ado, I will hand over to our wonderful guest speaker, the author of the book Beyond Web Measure, James Vincent. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter. The ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead was essentially a self-help menu for the recently deceased. Written by priests and in use throughout Egypt from around 1500 BCE, it was placed in coffins alongside the mummified remains of the dead to be there at their side to help them navigate the challenges of the underworld. One of the most important chapters in the Book of the Dead is known to archaeologists as Spell 125, the negative confession, in which supplicants declare their innocence of various misdeeds before Osiris, king of resurrection. These confessions take the form of 42 oaths and include the following lines. I swear I have not diminished the palm measure. I have not falsified the cubit of land. I have not added to the weights of the balance and I have not nullified the plummet of the scales. After supplicants made this declaration, they would proceed to a final test. Their heart was placed in a pair of scales alongside a single feather representing Mart, goddess of truth and justice. If their sins outweighed the feather, their heart would tumble to the floor to be eaten by the crocodile-headed goddess Amit, a second and final death. If the scales were balanced, they could proceed to heaven. For the ancient Egyptians, this was Seket Aru, or the Field of Reeds, a paradise of lush, endless grassland that resembled the Nile Delta in blue. These excerpts from the Book of the Dead capture the importance of measurement in ancient society. They show that it was not only a civic responsibility to maintain consistent units of length and weight, but that measurement itself was a symbol of order, a method of judgment and knowing that could sort right from wrong, innocent from sinner. The ancient Egyptians were not alone in holding such reverential attitudes towards measurement, and the earliest records of human society are littered with similar testaments. Here, for example, is a statue of Gadea, ruler of the Mesopotamian city-state of Lagash from around 2100 BC. In his lap, you can see architectural plans for a temple and at the front, a triangular prism ruler, one of the earliest depictions of such a tool. Gadea's legacy was as a pious king, a builder of temples, but such work was impossible without measurement. Here is the Louvre Stele, on which is engraved the Code of Hammurabi, our best preserved and oldest legal text. The text itself contains numerous references to correct measures, but take a closer look at the relief at the top. Next slide, please. The standing figure is Hammurabi, who is receiving symbols of royal authority from the god of justice, Shamash. These take the form of a rod and ring, which are usually interpreted as a yardstick and measuring rope. Think of it like this. There is a reason that a ruler in English is both a length of material marked with regular intervals and an individual with the power of life and death over their fellow humans. As these ancient monuments show, to rule is to rule. Measurement is power. Next slide, please. 
All this invites the question, why exactly is measurement so important to human civilization? The clearest explanation, I think, comes from the historian of science, Theodore Porter, who describes quantification in general as a technology of distance. As Porter explains, quantification is a discipline that uses shared rules to bridge disparities of culture and geography, and so allow for the exchange of information across time and space. Quantification, writes Porter, minimizes the need for intimate knowledge and personal trust and enables communication that goes beyond the boundaries of locality and community. Measurement and other forms of quantification therefore constitute a language that allows groups of humans to communicate and collaborate. Measurement is the dialect spoken by merchants and traders at the docks, by builders on construction sites, and by scientists in the lab. And through their work, society can grow and flourish. The last domain of scientific work is particularly notable, I think, as measurement is arguably the foundation of the scientific method. If we could not measure, then we could not record observations about the world around us. If we could not record observations, then we could not conduct experiments. And if we could not conduct experiments, then we could not learn bit by bit how the world actually works. Uh, next slide, please. In ancient societies, this dynamic is perhaps most obvious in the work of Babylonian astronomers and astrologers who created elaborate tables detailing the movements of stars and planets in the night sky. Next slide, please. These tables helped them sieve out irregularities like the appearance of comets, which they believed were prophetic messages sent by the gods. Of course, using the movement of stars to predict the fate of humanity is superstition, but the underlying methods of careful observation and pattern finding are essentially scientific in form. For these and other reasons, establishing rules, practices and habits of measurement is work as old as civilization itself. Often this work is practical. Many ancient societies, for example, employed special officials to inspect weights and measures in markets, from the metronomy of ancient Athens to the bulletai of the Byzantine Empire. They also place standards in public arenas, allowing citizens to check measurements for themselves. Next slide, please. In this picture, for example, you can see the walls of a medieval marketplace in Padua, Italy. From left to right, the shapes you see on the wall are the standard sizes for roofing tiles, loaves of bread and bricks, all sold at the market. It's a powerful example of how visible standards of measurement used to be and how important local authority is to their upkeep. Holding loaves up to these standards, the citizens of Padua could rely on the Paduese government to quite literally sanctify their daily bread. Next slide, please. All this means is that control over units of measurement is incredibly important for states, for both symbolic and practical purposes. Measurement is not something that wars are waged over necessarily, but it is an issue often settled by conquest and revolution. It's why measurement is mentioned so frequently in political documents like Magna Carta, pictured, and the US Constitution, and why powerful political authorities tend to leave their mark on metrology. Perhaps the best example of this connection between political power and measurement in the classical period comes from ancient Rome, which deployed a rigorous system of measurement across its empire. A key application was in land surveying, which helped Rome lay out orderly, orderly military encampments, straighten its newly built roads, and divvy up conquered territory to retiring vet veterans. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see uh, uh, an illustration of an ancient Roman using a groma, a sort of plum uh, bob used to uh, set straight lines. So measurement was undoubtedly a tool of empire for the Romans. And across Europe today, we can still see the legacy of Roman metrology in the near ubiquitous unit of weight, the pound. The English pound, the German pfund, the Dutch pund, and the Italian libra and more are all derived from the Roman libra pondo, Latin for weight measured by scales. Wherever Roman legions marched, units derived from the libra pondo survive today. Next slide, please. Of course, these European pounds are now defined using very different measures. More precisely, they are defined using the world's most important system of measurement, the metric system, which was created during the fervor of the French Revolution, though it has many origins, including in England. The metric system was designed to meet demands that were both practical and ideological. 
It was intended to help the people of France who were languishing under the confused system of weights and measures of the ancien regime, but also to define the new French citizen as a rational Republican entity. First though, the practical. Ancien regime measures were notoriously profligate, even in their own time. Journeying through France in 1789, the English travel writer Arthur Young bemoaned the tormenting variations of the country's units of weight and measure. The infinite perplexity of measure exceeds all comprehension, wrote Young. They differ not only in every province, but in every district and almost in every town. This was due in part to a lack of centralized authority in France to enforce standardization. The right to define units was often claimed by local lords as part of a broader package of noble prerogatives. This created not only variety, so that the capacity unit known as the pint, for example, ranged in size from 0.9 litres in Paris to 3.3 litres in Précy Soutil, but also exploitation. Lords would frequently collect payments of grain from peasants using larger bushels than those in the market, for example. This led to a popular pre-revolutionary slogan that demanded one law, one weight, and one measure. In other words, equality. Slide, please. The intellectuals leading the French Revolution saw opportunity in this dissent, not only to standardize units of weight and measure and so improve the lives of citizens, but to create a system of measurement that would itself embody the era's greatest ideals of, rash, of reason, nature, and universality. As Charles Maurice de Talleyrand Perigo, the political driving force behind metric system, the metric conversion, argued in front of the National Assembly in 1790, when a nation is resolved to establish a great reform, it is necessary that it should avoid, nay, even that it should be cautious not to do the work by halves, lest it should be obliged to perform it over again. And so the metric system, with its new names and prefixes, its decimal numeral system and its interconnected units, was born. It was a scientific triumph, certainly, but also an ideological one. Think, for example, how the Enchant regime's standard unit of length, the pied du roi, a linear measure dating back to Charlemagne that literally translates as the foot of the king, was replaced by the meter, which was defined as one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator. It is a revolutionary exchange, with authority passing from the body of the king to an arbiter thought to be impartial and changing and accessible to all, the earth itself. But this is the French Republican calendar in front of us here. Don't, uh, <clears throat> the revolutionaries accompanied this work with other changes to the structures of everyday life. They created a Republican calendar that removed the influence of the church from the temporal ordering of society. Instead of a seven day week that pivoted on a church going Sunday and that was stuffed with festival festivals dedicated to saints, there was the 10 day decade furnished with its own festivals celebrating Republican virtues. Uh, uh, next slide, please. The vogue for decimalis decimalization went so far as to extend to the measure of time itself. The 24 hour clock was briefly replaced during the French Revolution with a 10 hour day, with each day containing 100 minutes and each minute 100 seconds. Of course, the day itself remained the same length, no matter what unit it was measured by. This meant that the decimal second had to be shortened to fit the new system, becoming 14% shorter than a standard second. It was a suitable abbreviation for an era in which time itself seemed to be speeding ever faster into the future. Uh, next slide, please. It was these revolutionary excesses that helped ferment anti-metric anti sentiment in countries like the US and the UK. In the 19th century, as nations across Europe and South America adopted metric units, groups on both sides of the Atlantic began marshalling their arguments against this system of measurement. Some of these objections were practical. For example, the fact that the meter was defined using the planet's meridian, a measure which varied depending on longitude, alienated some would-be backers like Thomas Jefferson. The new names and decimal numeral system also proved objectionable to many, with the latter seen as inferior to base 16 and base 12, a point that I think was much more persuasive and reasonable at a time when most goods were bought loose and not prepackaged. But the association with the French Revolution itself also marred metric for many. Its units were decried as unnatural, atheistic, and worst of all, foreign. 
an editorial from The Times in 1863, written after a vote to adopt metric units nearly passed the House of Commons, declared that conversion would fill every household in Britain with perplexity, confusion and shame. It is of no use to urge that other countries have undergone this revolution and survived, thundered the author of the op-ed. What are France, the Zolverine and Portugal to us? They are accustomed to revolution, earthquakes and wars. Uh, next slide, please. A particularly unlikely strand of anti-metric sentiment strung, sprung from the pseudoscience known as pyramidology. The belief that ancient wisdom was encoded in the stones of the Great Pyramid of Giza by the creator himself. This wisdom, it was believed, could itself be re revealed by careful measurements of these stones, which were supposedly laid out using a unit known as the sacred cubit. Uh, next slide, please. The existence of this unit had fascinated individuals throughout the ages, including Isaac Newton, who believed it was used to construct Noah's Ark and Solomon's Temple. But in the 19th century, adherents claimed it was the metrological ancestor of the British inch, which is roughly 0 0.04 of the sacred cubit. This, they declared, meant that the inch was a unit divinely bestowed on humanity by God, and that the pyramids were intended to enshrine this measure for all time. They called it our inheritance in the desert. The influence of these arguments can be seen in the work of groups like the International Institute for Preserving and Perfecting Weights and Measures, an American anti-metric pressure group that led a brief but intense life in the 1870s and 1880s. The group wrote pamphlets, lobbied politicians and gave speeches in favor of traditional measures. Um, next slide, please. They even had a theme song titled A Pints a Pound, The World Around, that combined jingoism and faith in stentorious iambic measure. You can see some verses here, and I will just briefly read out the fourth. Then down with every metric scheme taught by the foreign school, we worship still our father's God and keep our father's rule. A perfect inch, a perfect pint, the Anglo's honest pound shall hold their place upon the earth till time's last trump shall sound. Which is just fantastic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Arguments like these were not what ultimately won the day against the adoption of metric measures in the British Empire and in the United States. In the end, it was the economic heft and geographical breadth of these entities that offered security for traditional measures. The vast internal measures of the empire and the states meant that harmonizing trade with other nations was just not a priority. And the country's huge capital investment in factories and machine tools that used traditional measures meant that conversion would be particularly costly for them. However, as we've seen in the past few weeks with the debate over the return of imperial units, Practical arguments are not always the most important in metrological matters. It's my belief that Boris Johnson's consultation on imperial measures is simply a nostalgic throwback, a spectacle designed to soak up newspaper headlines, energize the conservative base and distract political rivals. But I do think Johnson has unwittingly tapped into a rich theme of culture and heritage. Measurement is not some forgotten byway of history. It is hugely important to the development of the nation state, to international politics, and to the everyday lives of countless humans. It is an intellectual feast, and the more attention we pay to it, the better it is for us all. In short, measurement matters. And that's my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Um, with that, I will thank you all for joining us and bring the meeting to a close.